Well, you're listening to WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. You're listening to the Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're going to turn now to last week's trial, Warren versus DeSantis. In August, Governor Ron DeSantis suspended the elected state attorney in Hillsborough County, Andrew Warren, and then Warren sued DeSantis. There was a three-day trial last week in Tallahassee. Warren's challenge is on First Amendment grounds. DeSantis's executive order focuses on how Warren signed statements from prosecutors around the nation pledging that they won't pursue criminal cases against people who seek or provide abortions or gender transition treatment. Warren says the governor used the powers of his office to suppress criticism and promote cronyism. We don't have audio from inside the courtroom, so we'll have to rely on the print reports of what's been said. Joining us right now by Zoom is Louis Varelli, a professor of constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law in Gulfport. Welcome back to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Professor Varelli. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you could come on to talk about this important case. So the governor suspended the elected state attorney. This is something we've known for a few months now, but just maybe to start with that point, how common is it for a governor to suspend an elected official? It's very unusual. Um, there are a few recent examples of Governor DeSantis doing this, but they're overwhelmingly connected with criminal charges or the kinds of really extreme circumstances one would expect. The standard for suspension under the Florida Constitution is a very high bar, and that's in part because the people being suspended are elected officials. And as a general matter, um, the removal or the, the prevention of an elected official from doing their, the job they were elected to do is meant to be a very rare occurrence, and that's true here too. So if is there recourse? Are there checks and balances? Once someone gets suspended, is there any way that they can challenge that? Well, we're seeing it, right? You can challenge it in the courts, and the standard would generally be that the governor has overstepped um, his or her bounds under the Florida Constitution. Um, that's going to be a large part of the conversation surrounding um, State Attorney Warren, but of course there's a First Amendment claim in his case as well. Before the trial even started, the both sides weighed in on whether on who would be able to testify. And Warren wanted the governor to testify, to tell him and to tell the public why Warren was suspended. And the governor said he didn't want to, to testify during the trial. And the judge sided with the governor. What do you make of, of that decision by the judge? Well, I think it was a re it was a reasonable and and um an important request to have the governor testify. And I mean, the First Amendment claim is going to depend largely on the governor's intent and what was going through the governor's mind when he chose to suspend Andrew Warren and why. Um, but it's also not unusual for judges to be cautious about having any elected official testify against their will, especially um, someone with the rank of governor. So what the judge did in the case was say, um, I'm not going to require the governor to testify necessarily, but if something comes up during the trial where I change my mind, I reserve the right to do that. The judge did not change um, their mind, and uh, Governor DeSantis ultimately did not testify, but lots of people close to him were allegedly with knowledge or with this, ostensibly with knowledge of what he was thinking when he made this decision did testify. So we should have some pretty good information for the judge to consider in that regard. Our guest is Louis Varelli, a professor of constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law. You're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And we are talking about the Andrew Warren versus Ron DeSantis trial that happened last week in Tallahassee. During that trial, an attorney who represents DeSantis said that Andrew Warren's actions were in the role of a policymaker and should not be considered a First Amendment violation. So what does the law and precedent talk tell us about that, that uh, statement? Well, this is a common sort of um, line drawing exercise that we do in First Amendment claims. So the First Amendment protects speech. It does not protect conduct. And that's um, sort of a rough way of describing how a lot of these disputes um, occur. Um, Andrew Warren is claiming, and I think has a pretty compelling case, that signing a letter is a form of speech. Um, we're to, we're, we are to remember that he is an elected official, so it is important that he tell his constituents what he thinks, right? And that is a form of protected speech. Um, if he were to draft a policy for his office requiring line attorneys in his office, people who work for him, to, pre, to prejudge cases um, before they arrive in his office, that would be a separate problem. Um, but there's a very good argument that is not what happened here. And that's really what the crux of this is about, right? Did Andrew Warren actually do anything that would suggest he's not fulfilling the obligations of his office? And I think the answer is certainly not yet. And there's a really good debate about whether or not he ever would have done anything that would have constituted a um, violation of his legal obligations as state attorney. 
So I'm hearing you say not yet. He has done nothing wrong yet. So um, just on my basic knowledge of law, it almost sounds like um, case closed. Obviously, it's not that simple, but why don't you walk us through um, what steps the judge would have to take in his mind to to um, go from the, the Andrew Warren has done nothing wrong yet to actually siding with the governor? Well, I think what well, I think what the judge in this case would have to do is find difficulty with the First Amendment claim specifically. So the reason, or and I'm not um, privy to any inside information about what um, State Attorney Warren's team was thinking, right? But one of the reasons to bring a First Amendment claim is that it puts the case in federal court, which would remove it from the federal, prevent it or exclude it from the Florida state courts. And of course, the Florida Supreme Court is um, dominated by a supermajority of DeSantis appointees. I'm not suggesting, I don't know for sure that's what happened in terms of decision-making, but the First Amendment claim has that advantage for State Attorney Warren. The First Amendment claim is harder to prove than a simple violation of the Florida Constitution. Right, so the Florida Constitution sets a very high bar for a governor to suspend an elected official. I think it's very, very hard to make an argument that Governor DeSantis met that bar in suspending Andrew Warren for signing a letter. Um, but in the Fed and federal court, um, State Attorney Warren is going to have to prove something slightly um, beyond that. He's going to have to prove that he was suspended because of what he said. And that's a harder um standard to meet because it requires sort of an extra level of intent on behalf of the decision maker. Our guest is Louis Varelli, a professor of constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law in Pinellas County. And you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe on 88.5 FM. It's 1033 in the morning. We have already established that Governor DeSantis asked to not have to testify and did not testify during the trial, but several of his colleagues and his his appointees, I guess, or his his uh, the people that worked for him did testify. And we read reports about testimony from Larry Keefe, who was an advisor to DeSantis, and he was called Florida's public safety czar. A year ago, DeSantis asked Keefe if any state attorneys were not following the law. And so during the trial, we heard about details of the ad hoc inquiry, and the judge pressed Keefe about whether he had talked to mainly Republicans. So it sounds like there was a, at least a hint of, of a suggestion of, or a perception that this was a one-sided inquiry that the governor's office did. Might that sway the judge? It could certainly go to this intent question we've been talking about, right? So the question is going to be, why did the governor suspend Andrew Warren? Andrew Warren's claim is because of what I said, because of my ideology and my pol and my positions about certain laws, my personal beliefs about them. Um, and the governor is going to say, no, it's because you didn't do your job, right? An inquiry that is overwhelmingly partisan suggests that ideology might be a driving factor in a way that a more neutral, objective inquiry might not. That's sort of one of the things the judge is going to have to consider. And so getting to that question of ideology versus actions, uh, the Keefe, this public safety czar who worked for DeSantis, said by signing the joint statements, Andrew Warren was effectively nullifying the law. So is that an action by signing the statements? And is that nullifying the law? Are there other cases that might give us some insight here? Well, I think it is, it's a very difficult leap to say that signing a letter is less like speech than it is like nullifying Florida law. First of all, one of the things that um, is in that letter was not a matter of Florida law at the time, the um, access to medical care by transgender individuals, right? There was no Florida law about that topic, even though it's mentioned in the letter. Um, and the letter multiple times mentions exercising discretion which is a prosecutor's prerogative. So if we're trying to decide whether a letter is speech or conduct, right? That's a difficult, it's difficult to argue that it is more conduct than speech. As for nullifying the law, right? Um, State Attorney Warren hasn't done anything yet. So it's difficult to say that he is ignoring the law. And in terms of other cases, the closest example we have was State Attorney Aramis Ayala in Orlando, who made a statement and had made decisions not to prosecute capital cases was firm about that. Capital cases were um, legally part of her discretion. She said, she said something much more clear, much clearer, excuse me, than uh, State Attorney Warren said. And she was not suspended from office. A collection of cases were removed from her purview and were assigned to another um, state attorney to oversee them. That's the closest we have, um, I think, analog to this case. And that was during Governor Rick Scott's administration, not during Governor DeSantis's administration. Correct. And my understanding is at the time, relatively unprecedented, even on the grounds that Governor Scott 
um, pursued, let alone what Governor DeSantis has done here. Our guest is Louis Varelli, a professor of constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law, and we're talking about Andrew Warren versus Ron DeSantis. The three-day trial happened last week in Tallahassee. Uh, Stetson, uh, sorry, uh, Andrew Warren was suspended, that is, by Governor Ron DeSantis back in August, and he is suing on First Amendment grounds to get his job back. So this public safety czar that we've been talking about who worked for Ron DeSantis and was trying to get to the bottom of whether any prosecutors in Florida were breaking the law in DeSantis's words or in Keefe's words, said that Warren was creating an environment of lawlessness chaos in presumably in Hillsborough County by by signing these letters and and uh, agreeing to use prosec prosecutorial discretion or not prosecuting these abortion crimes or these things that weren't even crimes yet having to do with uh, operations for transgender people. So the residents of Hillsborough all through this time were experiencing this environment of lawlessness and chaos that the governor's office was describing, but they still reelected Warren. Will the judge take that into account? I think that's actually the crux of this case. And that's, I think, maybe the most important thing for um, your listeners to understand, right? Andrew Warren does not and never has worked for Governor DeSantis. There are a lot of officials in the state of Florida who do work for Governor DeSantis, but state attorneys are not one of them. And the reason we know that is because they are elected. And an election, being an elected official, right, winning an election, um, comes with it a series of obligations and responsibilities that are unique to that individual and local to those constituents. Right? It is up to the voters of Hillsborough to decide whether the environment created by Andrew Warren is acceptable to them, and they thought it was. If what this amounts to is the governor's office thinking that Andrew Warren is not doing his job the way they would prefer him to, that is unquestionably not grounds for suspension. And that is, in my view, the best version of their argument, the closest they can come to finding any sort of malfeasance um, by Andrew Warren would be to say, well, we think he should be doing things differently. But that's the nature of prosecutorial discretion. When we, if I exceed the speed limit on my way to work, which unfortunately I do regularly, it is up to the police officer I pass to decide whether I'm going to be pulled over that day. Failing to pull me over is not nullifying the law. Deciding in advance that people in, the, in their mind that people le speeding less than 10 miles an hour are less likely to be pulled over or probably should not be pulled over in favor of focusing on people going 20 miles over the limit is also not nullifying the law. Those are decisions that prosecutors and law enforcement make all the time. And to be clear, that discretion is in the Florida Constitution. The Florida Constitution grants prosecutorial discretion to state attorneys. So the elected nature of this, the prosecutorial discretion nature of this, make the decision by Governor DeSantis a really extreme remedy to a problem that certainly has not occurred yet, but likely doesn't exist at all. And I think it's important that we understand that dynamic. I want to remind people that we're speaking with Louis Varelli, a professor of constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law in Gulfport. And this is WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're talking about Warren versus DeSantis. We have someone from the area code 941 that writes in, is it not a prosecutor's responsibility to uphold respect for the law? Don't they swear an oath to do this? If a prosecutor states that there are some laws he will respect and others that he won't, what kind of example does that set for the people? So, Professor Varelli, how would you respond? Well, and as a general matter, of course, the comment is um, is correct and thoughtful, right, and uh, and insightful. Yes, prosecutors enforce the law, um, but prosecutorial discretion is has always been and always, and I mean for centuries, in American in American law and its um, and its ancestry, right, and, and British common law has always been. Um, an important part of the job, right? It is not possible to enforce every law to its fullest. Otherwise, we do not have the resources to do that. And judgment calls are, ne are necessary. See my example about speeding, right? Um, what Andrew Warren said, if it amounted to him refusing all abortion prosecutions in, this, in his district, in his county, there would be an argument that he was neglecting his duty. He has not done that. He signed a letter suggesting that the law in Florida is unconstitutional. To be clear, the 15-week ban on abortion is currently unconstitutional, right? It's not unconstitutional under the federal constitution because the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. But under existing Florida precedent, the Florida Supreme Court has a line of precedent saying that the rights to abortion in Florida exceed those granted in Roe v. Wade. 
right? So as it currently stands, until the Florida Supreme Court says otherwise, Andrew Warren is correct. A 15-week ban on, on abortion in Florida is unconstitutional. And making that kind of decision is, in fact, part of his job, right? So for him to say, I'm not going to enforce an unconstitutional law until I hear otherwise is not a dereliction of duty. In fact, it's sort of a thoughtful way to let the courts, um, to let, let the law run its course through Florida constitutional law. But it's also important to remember that it is necessary to make judgment calls, right? If he were to act as if it was impossible to be prosecuted for an abortion crime in Florida, then we'd have a meaningful conversation about suspension. We are nowhere near that, right? And Governor DeSantis doing this at this stage is at best premature. The Andrew Warren side, this is going to go, this question is going to go to the whole question of whether it's a First Amendment or an action that Andrew Warren was suspended for. His Warren side claims that his suspension was for his beliefs or his politics and not for anything he did wrong. And to use to bolster that case in court, it came up that the in the trial that the information that an early draft of the order suspending Warren mentioned the Democratic Party and mentioned George Soros, a donor to Democratic causes and to progressive causes. So um, does, does the fact that that draft was mentioning kind of political topics and maybe later on that was taken out of the, the executive order, could that play in, in, in have a play in the judge's decision? Sure. I mean, I think we have to be careful about how we interpret drafts of documents that are ultimately published in a different form. Um, but it all goes to the larger point, right? Is Andrew Warren's suspension really for a failure to do the job? And it has to be a profound failure under the Florida Constitution. It's not a matter of not being good at the job. Incompetence is a term that we see in this area of law at the federal and state level all the time. And it does not mean could be better at the job. It means completely incapable of doing it or refusing to doing it to do it in, in its entirety, basically. Um, if what we are going to have to determine is whether Governor DeSantis um, suspended Andrew Warren because of his viewpoints about certain laws and because they did not align with the governors. The, that draft may speak to that, right? but certainly isn't dispositive. There's going to be a lot of evidence that the judge is going to have to consider. And going forward on that uh, viewpoints point of view, uh, uh, point that you were making, Florida Politics reported that during the trial, DeSantis' staff was asked to define the term woke, and they testified during the trial that it's the belief that there are systematic injustices in U.S., and DeSantis doesn't believe there are systematic injustices in the U.S. is what they, is how Florida Politics is describing what happened at the trial when it comes to that. So does, so that further, I, I guess, would go to toward uh, making the point that it seems almost like the, that politics were at play more than actual whether an action was happening or not. If Governor DeSantis's position, of course, he didn't testify and he wasn't required to. The judge did not require him to. Um, so his 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 non testimony is not his fault in that regard. Um, but if in fact the reason that Andrew Warren was suspended was because of his alleged wokeness, then that's absolutely not a standard for suspension. And again, this is not to defend Andrew Warren's view on the law. It doesn't matter whether I, whether I or anyone agrees with Andrew Warren's view on the law. The question is, should the governor be able to suspend an elected official who was duly elected and by all accounts would be elected again and temporarily replace them with someone of the governor's choosing? I should also point out that, and again, I'm not a political scientist, but I think it's highly unlikely from everything I've read that the person chosen to serve in that position while Andrew Warren is suspended would not have been elected by the people of Hillsborough County. Um, they, um, as my understanding, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, share very different views or have very different views than Andrew Warren and share those views largely with the governor. That is the quintessential violation of sort of the rights and obligations of an elected official to replace, to not only suspend them, but to replace them with somebody who has an entirely different view than the one that the um, voters of that county supported. Our guest is Louis Varelli, professor of constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law. And you're listening to 88.5 FM WMNF Tampa. I'm Sean Canan, and this is WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. 
we have a, a someone who wrote in, Bubba wrote in, and uh, he's asking something that we we may have touched on, but maybe uh, he turned it, tuned in late. So let's I'll ask that again, and you can respond, Professor Varelli. He says, if I recall correctly, DeSantis sent Keefe, that's his his czar, for on a fishing expedition looking for prosecutors who didn't jibe with his views. Would the judge take that into consideration? It seems like DeSantis was looking for a problem that didn't exist, like the movie Minority Report. That's the email that came in from Bubba. Um, I think that goes to, to one of the themes we've been talking about, right? Which is the judge is going to be asked to determine why. Right? We don't always ask why in the law. Sometimes an outcome is enough to render something a legal violation. But when it comes to the First Amendment retaliation claim, it is why. Why did the governor suspend Andrew Warren? Evidence that the um, decision to suspend Andrew Warren was the product of a open-ended search looking for a particular kind or particular um, parties, prosecutors, um, of course, would be evidence of that, but wouldn't prove anything. Um, I'm not qualified to say whether that happened or not, um, but that would be evidence of this larger theme of why did the governor suspend Andrew Warren. Jeff writes in and, I, and says, I think it's a game. The governor makes an appeal to the Fox News crowd, nailing a Democrat, fighting crime, wokeism, liberal policies, et cetera. If Warren gets his job back, I would imagine DeSantis doesn't really care. It might even get Republicans more fired up and brought in DeSantis's appeal to that base. So none of those points have to do with the law, Professor Varelli, but I don't know, is there anything in there that you'd like to, to uh, answer about? Just this, um, and I'm I'm not an expert in any of that, so I won't I won't comment on whether or not um, I think that's correct because I just don't know. I don't certainly don't know any better than the caller um, or the the commenter. But I would say that the notion or the perception that the governor may have behaved in that way is problematic for a constitutional democracy um, like Florida and like all of the states in the union and the country. When the, when the perception created by the chief executive, whether it's the president or the governor, is I am doing this for vengeful or ideological reasons, I am extending the understood and historical scope of my power, right? I'm pushing the boundaries of what I'm, what I'm empowered to do because of my views about somebody else, else's, um, particularly an elected official's choices about how to do their job, that creates a problem that weakens the democracy generally, right? Um, it weakens the value of elections. It weakens our confidence in the motivations and good faith of our public officials. Whether it's true or not, I think that's something that every governor should think about when they um, suspend elected officials. And I think that's why we don't see this very often or certainly hadn't seen it um, until recently. The judge has said that he won't rule until at least the middle of this month. And so um, right now we're left to wait and speculate perhaps about what might happen. So obviously we're speculating and we, uh, you know, we're just relying on our educated um, assumptions about what might happen. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions about what might happen. Of course, we don't know for sure. So one possible outcome perhaps would be that the judge would find fault in some of the things that Warren did like signing the statement, for example, but Perhaps the, after doing that, the judge could also decide that because there weren't any cases that came to him, that DeSantis had no basis to suspend Warren. What do you think about that per possible outcome? That certainly um, strikes me as a sensible possibility. The one caveat I'll add, though, is that the First Amendment claim complicates these things. And this is what I was talking about before, the difference between being in federal and state court. If this were just a matter of whether Governor DeSantis violated the Florida Constitution, then you could say, well, he did violate the Florida Constitution. He overreached his suspension power. Um, and the judge could include in a decision a comment about how this is unbecoming of a state attorney to sign a letter like that. But here, Andrew Warren's got to prove something else. He's got to prove that the purpose, the reason for his suspension was protected speech. So the judge is going to have to go beyond that and say, um, yes, Governor Sanders may or may not have violated the Florida Constitution, but he more importantly, violated Andrew Warren's First Amendment rights by punishing him for something he said on a matter of public importance, which would be consistent with his First Amendment rights. That's the interesting, the most interesting part legally to this case is the framework in which it comes to the court. So what do we know about previous cases or precedent that might give us a clue as to how the judge could decide? It's very difficult. We have very little. Um, and the First Amendment is very often um, done in sort of a case by case or context specific way, because of course every speech act comes with its own terms. I think um, 
from my perspective, a really important part of this is the elected nature of Andrew Warren's office, and I can't say that enough. Um, at the federal level, law enforcement are not elected. Right? The Attorney General and United States attorneys are not elected. So this would be a very easy case. The president can fire those folks for any reason whatsoever. But when we have an elected official like this, they part of their participation in the electoral process is to speak to their constituents and to take public positions so that we can be better informed when we choose them. So I think there's a much stronger case for the First Amendment because Andrew Warren was elected. And I think the judge will agree with me on that, whether he finds this to be a violation or not is, um, of course, something that I couldn't predict. And what would be the remedy if the judge does side with Andrew Warren and says, yes, your First Amendment rights were violated? Does that mean he would get his he could get his job back? Yes. My uh, my understanding is he'd be he, one of the remedies would be that he'd be reinstated. And it's, it's also important to remember um, that Andrew Warren has not been fired or removed. Removed is a, is a legal term that means no longer holding that position. That's not a possible choice for the governor. The governor, um, under no circumstances, has the power to remove. Only the Senate can do that. The governor suspended Andrew Warren. So I refer to him as state attorney Warren, not to make a point, but to be accurate. He still is the state attorney. He's just not currently working as such. Um, Ms. Lopez is working as the state attorney, but she is not the new state attorney. There isn't a new one. He's suspended. Um, and that's something we need to keep in mind. So I think the, the remedy would be if, if, in fact, Andrew Warren were to win, and a win would look like him being reinstated. And you mentioned the Senate having being able to do that, meaning being able to remove Andrew Warren from office. You're, I assume you're referring to the state Senate. Is that impeachment? It's not impeachment. He's not impeachable under Florida law, but it is it is the suspension process under the Florida Constitution. If the Senate has the ability to basically make a suspension permanent by agreeing with the governor, but the Senate, the Florida Senate also has a rule that says while there are pending legal challenges to a suspension, we will not make that decision. So the Senate, um, the, the, the Senate wrote a letter saying they are holding their proceedings in abeyance until we get a court decision. And at that point, if if Andrew Warren wins his challenge and is reinstated, then the Senate wouldn't have anything to act on. If he loses his challenge and is not reinstated, then maybe the Senate will go to the trouble of removing him. But it would be, um, I don't know, I don't know how, um, how much that would add in that he wouldn't be returning to the job anyway. Um, but for now, they're waiting, like the rest of us, to hear from the courts. Our guest is Louis Varelli, a professor of constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law in Gulfport. And we're talking about the case Andrew Warren versus Ron DeSantis, which went to trial for three days last week in federal court in Tallahassee. You're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. So since you're a constitutional law professor, I want to ask you about a non-Florida story right now that does have to do with the Constitution. Uh, everyone has heard that former President Trump, who was referring here to his lie that the 2020 election was stolen from him, wrote over the weekend, this is a quote from the former president, a massive fraud of this type and magnitude allows for the termination of all rules, regulations, and articles, even those found in the Constitution. So as a constitutional law professor, what's your response to that, Professor Varelli? No, it doesn't. That's my short answer. Bra wrong, former President Trump. That's exactly what the Constitution does not permit. Right. There is lots of rhetoric in America about Thomas Jefferson's famous phrase, the tree of liberty is watered from time to time with the blood of patriots. Um, that is fine. And that was relevant in 1776 um, and 1789. That is not how a constitutional democracy functions, particularly one that does actually function the way ours currently does. The way to resolve claims of election fraud are judicial. They are legal and judicial. You go to the courts and an independent judiciary who cannot be fired or otherwise manipulated by the Congress or the president for that matter, um, because they serve for life, makes a decision about whether under the law, the election was valid. I think it was 70 federal judges, many of whom were appointed by President Trump at the time, upheld the outcome of the 2020 election. Not only is he wrong, but his claim that somehow this operates outside of the constitution is not only wrong, but frankly petrifying. Right. If that were true, what he's talking about is real anarchy, where a someone who says something loud enough and believes something somehow is entitled to engage in extra legal activity. That is not the way this country operates, um, nor is it the way it's designed. 
Our guest is Louis Varelli, a professor of constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law. We get an email here from Gary who writes, what in about, a, we're going back here to the Warren versus DeSantis trial, what in about an appeal of the judge's decision if he rules in Warren's favor, would it stay the decision and allow the suspension to continue if, uh, if Warren appeals after, DeSantis, if DeSantis wins and Warren appeals? Well, I think we'd have we'd have that problem either way, potentially. And I call it a problem only only because it would cause delay, right? Either way, I think there is a possibility that the Eleventh Circuit, which would be the court of the federal appellate court here, um, would stay the decision rendering their own their own outcome. I actually think there's lots of good reasons to do that, right? So um, if, for example, Andrew Warren were to win and the judge ordered reinstatement, and then the case were appealed, um, and then Governor DeSantis won on appeal, you would have Andrew Warren resuming his office and then and then being removed again or suspended again, excuse me, I've, I've made my own mistake. Um, so I think that's certainly a possibility. I also think it would be highly advisable for an appellate court to act quickly in a situation like that. Um, Andrew Warren's claim is really only as good as his term. So these decisions need to be made quickly so he can be reinstated if he were to, if he were to prevail um, and still have an opportunity to do the job for a meaningful period of time. And presumably he could, there, there are scenarios that where he could run again in what it would be two, two more years. Uh, and I'm not, um, I'm not an expert in the term, in, in term limits for state attorneys. I, I frankly don't know if there is one um, for uh, state attorneys in Florida, but as long as there is not, then yes. Let me ask, oh, there was another question. Oh, no, the, the other question was exactly the same as the first one. So thank you to Rick and to Gary for asking about the appeals. If there is an appeal that would go, am I right, to the appeals, the federal appeals court in Atlanta? Correct, the 11th Circuit. That's right. Our, our guest is Professor Louis Varelli, a Stetson University College of Law, constitutional law expert. And I want to ask about another topic that's outside of Florida, but kind of has a Florida connection. And we really only have about a minute, minute and a half left. But Ari Berman wrote in Mother Jones magazine yesterday about something called the independent state legislature theory and how right wing groups set the stage for the Supreme Court to rig future elections. We heard a bit about it an hour ago on Democracy Now! Tomorrow, the Supreme Court will hear Moore versus Harper, and the outcome will determine whether state legislatures, many of which are heavily gerrymandered and disproportionately controlled by Republicans, Republicans will be granted near king-like status to draw new redistricting maps, maps and pass restrictive voting laws with little or no review by state courts or other entities. So what does this have to do with Bush v. Gore in 2000 and, and perhaps even the redistricting that's happening in Florida, happened in Florida recently and is being challenged, Professor Varelli? Right. So the most recent example of this coming up was in Pennsylvania during the 2020 election, where the Pennsylvania legislature sought to um, change some of the election rules, laws surrounding the 2020 election. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said that change would violate the Pennsylvania Constitution. So it was the Pennsylvania courts checking the Pennsylvania legislature in a way that is a very common dynamic between legislatures and courts at the state level and at the federal level for that matter. The argument in the independent state legislature doctrine is that the US Constitution says that the rules for electing basically federal officials shall be set by the legislature of the states. And it uses the word legislature. And the argument is that what that really means is only the legislature. In other words, when setting federal election rules, state legislatures can make decisions independent of their own state constitutions. That is a really dramatic position to take. And what makes it particularly dramatic is that we never let legislatures operate outside of their own constitutions because the constitution is what created the legislature in the first place. Right. So what would the result of this in Moore v. Harper, if North Carolina were to win, it would be to say that the North Carolina legislature can make rules, even if they violate their own state constitution. And, and their state court judges couldn't do anything about it. Why does gerrymand why is that relevant to gerrymandering? Because if you've already drawn districts in a way that perpetuate one's party's success, that party can act without any checks on them internally and perpetuate that success indefinitely. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Professor Varelli. Thank you for having me. Louis Varelli is a professor of constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law in Gulfport. And you can watch this full interview beginning this afternoon on our website, WMNF.org. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. 
Thank you to everyone who donated during our recent membership drive. In this time slot tomorrow, Shelly will host Midpoint. Next up is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Their topic is the history of Tampa's signature sandwich, the Cuban sandwich, that's coming up after NPR headlines. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. Thanks so much for listening to 88.5 FM.